Welcome to the first law of thermodynamics in physical chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to this channel for future videos and notifications. So a concept that you've probably heard all the way back to elementary school is pressure. Right? If you've gone to uh, college and if you're take, listening to this, you probably did, and you took general chemistry, you talked about pressure in the context of the ideal gas equation. You may have, in Gen Chem, have even mentioned the Van der Waals equation of state for gases. Pressure is not just applicable for gases, it's applicable for liquids as well, right? We have this concept that if you go into a lake or an ocean or something, a body of water basically, that the pressure at two feet is a lot lower than the pressure at 500 feet down, right? The deeper you go into a liquid, the greater the pressure is. So pressure in general is a concept that we use to really dis it's a, it's a it is a parameter and it is a it's a it's a variable that describes some state of a fluid and the fluids that we're talking about are either liquids or gases okay in general in physical chemistry we're only going to deal with um, for the most part gases very briefly we'll talk about liquids in the context of solutions but we're really going to focus on gases because they are really the simplest systems that we can deal with. Okay, and to start out in thermodynamics, we're going to deal only with gases. So we first want to get an understanding of what pressure is. All right, so I have right here a perfectly spherical container. And I have this, whatever this green gas is in here. Okay, it's filled the container. And I'm going to introduce you at a concept called internal equilibrium. What does internal equilibrium mean? It means that for this, whatever this volume is, and the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, the pressure, which we'll talk about, should be identical at any point. The temperature should be identical at any point, And technically, the velocity of any gas molecule should also be identical. They're all the same. So when you're at internal equilibrium, the basic meaning is that all the state variables that you have don't change with time. Okay, so if I designated a state variable, that means that the change in the state variable s, the change in the state variable with respect to time is zero. Okay, there's no change in state variables. Everything's in equilibrium, and it's also another way of thinking is it's homogeneous. Okay, it also, the state variable does not change with position. Okay, and I'll just use a generic x for position, although this is spherical. But the state variable doesn't change with position. So any point here has the same pressure, same temperature. Um, if you were to look at a, a volume, it has the same number of moles of gas, same number of molecules. All the velocities are the same everywhere. Okay. Also, the energy is also equally distributed around here. Okay. Everything is homogenized. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick an infinitesimally small point here, dv, a volume. It's also spherical. And I'm just going to blow it up right here. Okay, so we're going to talk about what pressure is. All right, so this is an infinitesimally small spherical segment, dv. It has a radius dr. dr also approaches zero. All right, now what you have to imagine is at this point, okay, you have to imagine that there are gas molecules literally on average hitting this dv from all directions. And they're, in theory, hitting all directions equally. Okay, so I I've only indicated, obviously, six arrows, but they're technically for each theta angle and each phi, because we're in spherical coordinates, every one of the points on this sphere is getting hit equally over time by, by the gas. Okay? Now, what that means is that in order for, if you, if, you, in other words, if you were to stick something right there in the center, okay, if you were to stick a little object, an infinitesimally small object right there, right in the center of that dv, okay, if all of the forces from these gases are hitting that, that point equally at any given time, then in theory that dot shouldn't move, right? Because what does Newton's second law tell us? It tells us that if the forces are balanced around a point, all the forces are balanced, the net force is zero, and so there's no acceleration of this particle. Okay, so in theory, if I stuck a particle there and all the forces were hitting it 
around the sphere in all angles and all phi's and thetas and all that stuff, this particle shouldn't move, okay? But in order for the particle to not move, it has to follow Newton's third law, which is that for every action or every force, there is an equal and opposite force, which just means that if I were to apply a force right here, say this one right there, the particle, would, or whatever it is that's in there, would have to apply an equal and opposite force in the exact opposite anti-parallel direction. Okay, These forces that are in white, I'm going to say this is the force of the gas molecule. Okay, They're pushing against that particle. The, the force that the, the particle has to exert, which is equal and opposite, I'm going to call force sub x. Okay, it's equal and opposite and anti-parallel, and it's theoretically in all directions because it has to counteract all of these gas forces. Okay, so what do we know? All right, we know that the sum of the forces in any case is equal to ma. Now, I've put these little brackets around the a because that means the average acceleration. We know that gas molecules aren't static, right? They're always moving around. But on average, through this dv, through any volume in here, on average, the acceleration is zero because all the accelerations balance each other. You just add all the acceleration vectors and it all goes to zero because in theory they all balance each other. So all the forces should be zero, right? So what does that mean? Well, I would theoretically have to add all of the F sub G's, okay, together, and they're all pointing towards the center of the circle. And then I have to add all the other forces, the F sub X's, which point radially away from the circle, plus F sub X's and the sum of all of these, right? So what do I do? Well, this is all equal to zero, and what I'm allowed to do technically is do the same thing to everything in the equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum of all these forces here and divide by area. Okay? So basically what I'm going to do is when I take force divided by area, that's equal to pressure. And that's basically what you've probably known. Force over area is a pressure. Okay, so in other words, the pressure that the gas is exerting, which is proportional to this force, P sub G, plus P sub X, the pressure that is being exerted by the particle against that force, P sub X, has to equal zero. Okay, and here is the key. Okay, P sub X, the pressure that is being exerted against the force of the molecule, is what we just say P, and is the pressure of the gas at any point in the container, assuming the gas or the system is in internal equilibrium. Okay, so whatever, if I pick another point right here, okay, the force that the particle, if I stuck a particle there for it to not move, in other words, to say static, the force it would have to exert in all directions against the molecules hitting it from all directions, if you divide that force by the area, that's the pressure there. It's also the pressure here. It's the pressure here. It's the pressure here. It's the pressure at any point in this container when it's at internal equilibrium. And that's how pressure is defined. So another complicated way of thinking about this is if you were a person and you kind of enclosed off a little spot for yourself to live in. Let's say you were to live inside this little circle. The force or the pressure that you would have to exert on the walls of it to keep yourself from collapsing into nothing that's the pressure of the gas, basically. You have to push on the walls of that little DV container to prevent yourself from being collapsed into zero, okay, zero, uh, into nothing. The force or pressure that you have to exert, the pressure, that's the pressure of the gas, okay? Now, I was originally going to do this thing, explain this, but I'm not going to do that. Suffice it to say, pressure really comes out of um, sort of one of the definitions. It's the surface integral of the dot product, the P dot dA, is equal to the force. What that ultimately means, it's sort of kind of the same thing as what you did with Gauss's law, where you do um, imaginary surfaces. You get PA is equal to F, so pressure times the area is equal to F, and you manipulate this by dividing by A on both sides, and you get that the pressure is equal to force over area. So that's why I divided this by area, is because I can express this as a pressure. And what I'm really concerned about is this P sub X, that's the pressure of a gas. It's essentially if you stuck a little particle in that dV, a little particle, for it to stay static, what force, divided by area, does it have to exert in every direction to keep from moving? That's one way to think about it. And if you divide that force by the area, that's the pressure. And it's, like I said, the pressure at any point here inside the gas. Now, 
The one thing I'm going to talk about next, which is just going to lead us into the next topic, is sort of um, how you measure pressure using mathematical expressions. Okay, so in theory, I suppose if you had this container, you could stick a barometer into here and you could measure the pressure. And that's good and all. I mean, if you have a way to measure the pressure exactly, um, then do it. And to be perfectly honest, <coughs> anytime you're able to do a measurement, a measurement is better than a calculation. So this is a really important thing in science. What's the difference between a measurement and a calculation? What's the difference between a measurement and a calculation? All right. The difference is that a measurement is what you actually do in a lab. Okay, if you were to measure something, a good example of one that doesn't relate to this so that you could um, hopefully understand it. Let's suppose you, you're, you're where I am now, I'm at the um, Health Science Center, um, UT Health Northeast. Let's suppose I'm looking at my building, which happens to be, I believe it's three stories. Okay, let's suppose that they, set, they told you they told you that each story, well, I don't know, I'm just making up a number. Let's suppose it's, um, I don't know, 20 feet. This could be way off, I'm just making up. Let's say it's 20 feet per story, okay, of the building. So the calculation would say, if it's three stories, what's the height of the building? So the height would be of the building would be 20 feet per story times three stories. Stories cancel, and when you calculate this, it should be 60 feet. It's 20 times 3 is 60. But that's a calculation. Calculations are more theoretical. Let's say I actually go measure the height of the building. It's probably way off. But let's say I go measure the height of the building. And suppose I get 62 feet. Which one's right? The measurement's right. Okay. I mean, there's going to be some error in it, but the calculation was just based on a theory. The measurement was based on actually taking a giant ruler, theoretically, going from the ground up to the top of the building, and you measured 62 feet. Okay? The, the equivalent of this is if you were somehow able to stick a barometer in this container and measure the pressure, you'd theoretically get a, a, at least a, 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 an immensely more accurate uh, measure of the pressure. But sometimes doing that is not possible. You can't directly measure the pressure. So this is going to lead us into something called an equation of state. So let's think about real quick before we do anything else, some of the properties maybe of um, this container. What are some properties? Well, I would think that, first of all, it has a pressure. But notice it's a sphere, and it has a volume, right? OK. So this has a pressure, it has a volume. Um, it also probably has a temperature. There's a temperature inside the container. <coughs> and that temperature may or may not be different than outside environment. Um, but there's also a number of molecules. Okay, there's a number of molecules inside the container, right? Now, you may be able to see where this is going. I'm going to do something, and hopefully you know how to calculate this from general chemistry. The number of molecules I'm going to convert ultimately into a quantity called n, which is the number of moles. Okay, It's related to the number of molecules through something called Avogadro's number. We're not going to deal with that right now. But suffice it to say, in theory, there's different properties of the gas in this container, and in theory, maybe the Pressure is related to volume, maybe it's related to temperature, and maybe it's related to the number of moles. And it turns out that it is. Okay. Now, what we're going to do in the next video is talk about what's called the ideal gas equation of state. So an EOS is just a way of saying equation of state. It's ultimately a, a way to relate these variables to each other. Okay. For an ideal gas, the equation of state is the pressure is equal to nr, which is the gas constant, times the temperature over the volume. This is the ideal gas equation of state. It tells you that if you know the volume, you know the temperature and the number of moles, you can calculate the pressure. We'll talk about in the next video, which is going to deal more with the ideal gas formula, that this is ideality, but it's not reality. 
Okay, this is this is more of an approximation, and it may or may not be very accurate. Okay, but suffice it to say, if you wanted to use the ideal gas equation of state, you could give an estimate of the pressure. I'm going to be coming out in just like five, uh, two minutes or something. So I'll be out in a minute. Are you going to be out here? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, in many cases with the ideal gas equation of state, there's significant error. Because as we'll find, it neglects the volume of particles, gases that is, neglects the volume, and it assumes that energy is totally conserved, and in reality it's not. Okay? You never have completely elastic collisions. They're more inelastic than elastic. Okay? So this is the ideal gas equation of state. Okay? It relates the number of moles, the, number, the temperature, and the volume ultimately to the pressure. So what you could do is, if you knew the temperature and the volume, the volume is pretty easy to calculate, especially for shapes like this, spheres. Okay? The temperature also is actually a lot easier to measure. Okay? You're the one who put the gas in, so you can calculate the number of moles. So if you know these things, then multiply n times r times t divided by p, and that gives you an estimate of the pressure. Okay, so this is, of course, the simplest of the equations, the one that you dealt with probably in general chemistry the most. It's the ideal gas equation of state. Okay, but the other thing I just wanted to indicate here is that when you do a, me a physical measurement, that's what you would use. You'd, if you're doing a calculation, the calculation is only as good as the model that you're using. Okay, if I, in other words, if I had a, a gas. Let's say instead of this container, I shrunk it to a container. Let's do it like this. Let's say I shrink it to a container that big. Okay, obviously the volume there is much lower, and the pressure is going to be way higher. Okay, and assuming I have the same number of moles of the gas. So it turns out that in cases where you have very high pressure and very low volume, this equation of state doesn't work. You don't have an ideal gas. And that's what I mean when I say your calculation is only as good as the model you use. The, the, the ideal gas form is only a model. Okay? If you have high pressure and low volume, this is a terrible model to use. You want to switch the model to do a different calculation. And in most cases, the calculation becomes a lot more complicated. Okay? But still, if you can directly measure the pressure, then that's the way you actually want to go. Okay? Um, but the calculation is only as good as the model, and some models are better for other types of gases, some are worse. In the case of high pressure, low volume, this is a horrible model. However, if you have a situation where you have pressure that approaches zero, so very low pressure, and volume that is very high, we usually indicate that approaches infinity, then this is actually a perfect model to use because you're approaching ideality. However, you always have a real gas. You don't ever have true ideality, but you can approach it. All right, so hopefully this gave you a little bit of intuition on what pressure is, and this is going to introduce us to measurements and calculations. And in most cases in the lecture, we're going to be doing calculations. In labs, you're going to be doing measurements and calculations. All right, so hopefully this makes sense. See you in the next video.